Okay, so let's start uh, this session. And I hope everybody, and first, thank you all for joining us again, and I hope you have had a very good break time. Well, joining me here now in this session uh, are three great scholars. Uh, I would like to introduce our guests and the topic of today. Well, our guests are going to talk about the open science initiatives, the post-spring pledge, and this session is going to be run by uh, Dr. Ali Alhuri from Saudi TESOL Association, uh, Professor Phil Hiver from College of Education, Florida State University, and uh, Professor Brian Nosek uh, from Center for Open Science and University of Virginia. Thank you all for joining us here. Uh, now let's uh, hand it over to Dr. Alhuri. Hello, Dr. Hello, thank you very Hello. much for this introduction. Um, before I start, I would like to say that this morning we heard the sad news that Professor Zoltan Dornier has passed away and he was uh, my supervisor and a friend and a mentor. So we dedicate this page which we are posting, we are um, launching today into his memory. So um, outline, so I'm going to first start uh, talking about the another previous initiative called the cost of knowledge then i will mention um, the post print pledge and then we'll see where we go forward so the cost of knowledge um, the cost of knowledge is an, an initiative started by someone mathematician called timothy growers in 2012 and the major purpose of this initiative was boycotting severe there were reasons for it, like high subscription fees for journals, bundling subscriptions, and support for anti-open access acts, especially in the United States. And this initiative garnered a lot of support, and it had over 20,000 signatories. And as you can see here, this is a screenshot of that uh, initiative. When you sign up, you can choose whether you want to refrain from publishing with Elsevier, refereeing for Elsevier, or doing editorial work, or all of them. So, how, how did this initiative go? So, a few years ago, there was a study evaluating this initiative, and they go, went back and saw the people who signed up to see whether they adhered to the pledge they made or not. The results show that 21% were unidentifiable, unidentifiable signatories, 19 had not published at all, 23% did publish in Elsevier, although the whole point of, the, of signing up was not to publish in Elsevier, and only 37% published in other venues other than Elsevier. So this wasn't very promising if only just one third, so something, you know, happened that didn't let make people adhere to the pledge. So as the author said, indeed rel relatively few researchers have signed the petition, petition in recent years, thus giving the impression that the boycott has run its course. So wh why did this happen? Why wasn't the impact stronger? Maybe because th that initiative was confrontational, boycotting an influential publisher that which could harm especially early career researchers somebody trying to sign up and say and thinking what if i need to publish a paper you know, five years from now in an elsevier journal as opposed to more established researchers there wasn't a sense of community you just sign up and leave it was for all fields so there was no accountability it was targeting only one publisher so in in terms of open science, is this going to fix open science? And notably, citing Elsevier was not mentioned, even though I think if you just mentioned citing Elsevier and forget about everything else, that would, would probably have a higher impact, especially if the reason you are signing up is that you think what Elsevier is doing is unethical. So for applied linguistics, especially there is now increasing interest in open science. So we decided to do this initiative, the post print. But first, what is a post print? This is a very critical point. 
the postprint is not the preprint. The pre the preprint means it has not been peer reviewed. The postprint is the accepted version of your manuscript after it has passed peer reviewed. So for preprints, many people may hesitate to share preprints for many reasons. Some people might believe that if they share preprints, their work might be scooped. Some people might be hesitant to share preprints because they think that during the review process, some mistakes might come up and, you know, let me wait. The post print is the accepted version of the paper. So as an illustration, this is an example. So this is the version of record. When you read the paper, you read, read it in this format or something like it. This is the accepted version. So it has the title here, it has the author's name, it has the affiliation. The current manuscript is the post print of a paper accepted for publication. And then you mention the journal and the DOI so that people can cite your paper. But this is not the preprint, this is the accepted version. If, if you want to share the preprint, that's, that's also up to you, but we are not talking about preprints here. So in fact, um, most, all, pretty much all publish, publishers require you that you mention this information when you post your post print. And even if they don't require you, you should you know, put this information so that people can cite you when, when they read this, inf you know, this paper. Otherwise they may not know how to cite this paper. So is posting preprints legal? So it depends on each publisher's policy. So we looked at 60 applied linguistics and second language acquisition papers from Web of Science. We looked at Sherpa Romeo to look at their policies and here are the results. These are the publishers that permit you to share post prints. Cambridge, Elsevier, John Benjamin Sage, et cetera, et cetera. These are okay with post prints. Some publishers allow you to post post prints on personal websites only, and then they have an embargo, usually one year for repositories. This includes Springer, Oxford University Press, and Taylor and Francis. Finally, the publisher that does not encourage post prints before an embargo period, usually 24 months, which is kind of too long, is Wiley. Surprisingly, before we started this study, we thought that Elsevier would be the worst offender here, but actually for applied linguistics at least, Wiley is the least progressive publisher when it comes to post print. Interesting fact. So what is this page is about? This is, um, um, does not ask anybody to break any laws because you know we will see in the next slide it's most publishers allow people to um, share post print. It's asking you to share post prints, not preprints. Again, if you want to share preprints, that's up to you. We are not talking about preprints here. It does not limit you to the 60 journals that you know again in the next slide we will see some of them and does not require you to boycott any publishers or anything like the cost of knowledge that, you know, the, the other initiative. So this is a short screenshot of the table. You can see the journal title here, the publisher, and then does it allow you to post the post print on your personal website? All of them say yes. If you scroll down from that page, you see some of them have an embargo period. On repositories, again, all these publishers say yes. Again, if you scroll down, you'll see some publishers having an embargo period because before you are allowed to. And then if you want to check for yourself, you can go to this link for each journal to see specifically the um, instructions and guidelines. So what do you do? In this initiative, we are asking applied linguists to share the post print of their accepted manuscripts online in line with the publisher's copyright. So we're not asking anybody to violate any copyright. 
you should include the publication details as we saw where you published this, the authors, the affiliations, the DOI when it's ready so that people can cite you. You may have a citation advantage also because if people can't read your paper, then they will be unlikely to cite it. You can choose a repository. There are several repositories, including OSF and some other archives that, you know, some of them are for linguistics, some of them are for education. All these are free. You go and create an account, post it, in, in some information, your name, where it was published, etc. etc. In less than five minutes, it will be online. After you post your post print, you are welcome to come to Applied Linguistics Research Methods Discussion Facebook group and share your post print for more publicity for your work. And I would like to thank Luke Plonsky for giving us the chance to for hosting this hashtag on this um, group. So we didn't we don't have Twitter here because applied linguistics doesn't seem to be a Twitter field. You know, very few linguists are on Twitter, unlike, for example, psychology. But as you can see here, the number of members in this group is, you know, a lot. Also, I would like to thank the people who supported this initiative, who had the time to read, uh, to read and respond and give us feedback on it, and agreeing to list their names as supporters so that other people can join this initiative. So this is the website of this initiative. Um, if you scan the QR code here, it will take you directly. You can read it, sign your name, and are doing the link is here i'm not sure if you can see the link but phil can probably uh, post the uh, link in the chat box finally again i would like to thank luke plonsky for hosting this on his uh, facebook group as well as cooper and muhammad for technical support while setting up this campaign finally is normalized post prints thank you Thank you, Dr. Alhuri, and I'm very sorry for your loss. Uh, it was great. Thank you. Now, Brian. Okay. Great. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here to talk about issues uh, in promoting open science uh, in the applied linguistics community. Uh, what I'd like to do in complementing uh, Ali's presentation about a particular initiative of promoting postprints is to talk about the broader challenge of how is it that we can motivate change uh, in open science uh, within our communities and what are the factors that might accelerate uh, that adoption and keep it aligned with the values that we have for why we are doing research in the first place. So one of the key things that is important, uh, I think, to recognize in the challenge and opportunity for motivating uh, change, culture change toward a more open science, is to recognize that many of the advocates have different kinds of motivations that bring them to uh, promoting open science practices, and those motivations are differently relevant for some of the different behaviors and initiatives that are promoting change. So, for example, the postprint pledge, pledge has a strong emphasis on democratizing access to knowledge. Who gets to participate? How do they get to participate? Uh, who can access uh, knowledge, not necessarily behind paywalls? There's also a lot of interest among open science advocates for improving inclusion uh, in research. Who gets to be involved in the research process and how might we broaden collaboration uh, and inc include more uh, people at different ways of which they uh, get involved in the research process. There's also uh, motivations for how we can make a more equitable distribution of the resources that promote and advance research. There's so much exclusivity in resources going to the already rich institutions, rich research laboratories or environments. Uh, and if we promote more equitable distribution, we may be able to accelerate and expand progress uh, by uh, providing resources uh, to more groups uh, to do more things more effectively. 
There's another class of motivations for open science that's really about improving transparency and sharing of research outputs so that we can both understand better how the research was done, but also promote reuse and extension of research more effectively. And greater transparency may also have roots and motivations for trying to improve accountability for research practice. If I know that you can see my data and my process more than just the, my, the report that I write, uh, I may change my practice in ways that is more reflective about how would you as a reader respond to the various decisions that I make uh, in the research process, the things that I decide to leave out, et cetera. And that's linked to the third area of common motivations for open science, which is really trying to figure out how can we do the research process better? How can we use more effective transparency and sharing of the research outputs to make it possible to do what we idealize science to be effective at doing, which is self-correct. We know we're going to be wrong a lot. Uh, we're going to offer ideas and interpretations and theoretical models that have significant limitations and are not necessarily aligned with the evidence uh, that we produce. And so an important part of the research process is to be able to identify error reduce uncertainty, and promote more effective models of how we understand the phenomena that we study. So open science can be a factor in helping to do that rather than having us depend on our best interpretation of what we think you did. Uh, we can actually get more into what we are each doing and building more effectively on the methods and data that we are producing. And that, of course, is linked to the overall promotion of rigor and reproducibility in science. So these different motivations are not mutually exclusive. One may have all of those motivations and what they would like to see change in open science. But recognizing that some people and some initiatives may emphasize one or more of these uh, to a different extent can help to facilitate better collaboration across the advocates for open science so that we are representing and aligning the various motivations that people have with the initiatives that we promote. And that has relevance for thinking about how do we advance a behavior change or a culture change strategy to be as effective as possible. A lot of what Ali described in the postprint pledge is thinking about here is an initiative that didn't quite work as effectively as we might have hoped, the cost of knowledge project. How might we translate this into one that is more effectively aligned with researchers' own interests? and something that can more easily be adopted and spread ac across the applied linguistics community. So what you see in the uh, pyramid uh, and the text uh, to the right is the theory of change that the Center for Open Science uses in how we think about developing initiatives and trying to implement them for sustainable behavior change. At the core is providing infrastructure to make it possible to do the behaviors okay, we wanna share papers more openly. Where can I do it? How do I do it? And if we can most effectively link those infrastructures to how researchers do their practice on a daily basis, provide training for how to implement that easily. As Ali mentioned, it takes five minutes uh, to post one's paper at one of those uh, services. That's easy. We all have five minutes somewhere in our day uh, where we could do that behavior. Uh, and the, the process for doing it is relatively straightforward. There isn't a big training exercise that you need for two hours uh, to figure it out. The whole purpose of this kind of event is to increase visibility of open science behaviors, form community around that interest. The Facebook page of announcing and making visible when you post a post print will then help others in the field say, oh, maybe this is a thing that we do now. Oh, this is something that we are now aligned on in order to advance the transparency of one of the motivations uh, of the, the post-print pledge of open science more generally. We're increasing access of our work to people who are in communities that don't have subscriptions uh, to all of these journals. And longer term, to the extent that we can make it rewarding for open science practices, it's not just something I'm doing because it's out of the goodness of my heart, but in fact, it's aligned with my career interests by making my papers more available, more accessible to people without the subscriptions, you're more likely to read it, 
you may be then more likely to cite it. You may be more likely to build on it. So it's in my active interest to post uh, these papers so that others can read them. And then of course, in some contexts, it's appropriate to think about how the policies may actually uh, require uh, these behaviors once we're trying to get to full adoption. Right? And, that, and that's really in, in the case of open access is in the context of national governments saying, we're paying for a lot of this research. We want the public uh, to have access to it. And so there's a number of countries that are now moving towards requirements for open access of different types of research outputs. So that is a change model, but there are different points of emphasis, different motivations that bring people along in adopting open practices from the outset of a new behavior to the full adoption by the community. And the uh, turned on its side uh, distribution may be familiar to many of you, uh, this is the classic Rogers diffusion of innovation model, the idea of how is it that new behaviors or new technologies get adopted and spread in a community. And we think about this uh, in relation to the theory of change model, where those innovators, people who are motivated by the behavior itself, who see the vision of what it would mean uh, to share our papers more openly, just providing infrastructure can be enough for them to adopt the behavior. And then moving it into making it easier and easier to do, early adopters maybe see this is an interesting behavior I'm willing to do just because I'm interested in the behavior itself. And so the fact that I can do it relatively easy may be sufficient. But just having the infrastructure and it being easy to do isn't enough to get the broader, the mainstream to adopt these behaviors. Events like this are critical to start to expand the visibility into the early majority, those that are, are responsive to what is it that are the norms of how our community does its work. And if we don't see that others in our community are doing it, I may be reluctant to say, well, I, I don't want to, it seems like a risk to do something that isn't normative in my community. So a key part of these initiatives is the visibility aspect of not just making your post print available, but also highlighting to others in the community that that is available. That hashtag uh, plays a significant role in starting to shift the norms of the community toward adoption. And then to the extent that you can point out and provide evidence for the mainstream about how this is actually in one's own career interest, not just because it's a good thing to do, uh, it makes it easier to bring uh, the rest of the mainstream along. And there will always be resistors, the laggards who are not an adoptive behavior because they've never done it before. Uh, and it's really only when things become required or so costly not to do them uh, that those, the end uh, adopts. So the various motivations that are occurring means that how we message and how we engage the community has to be responsive to where we are in the adoption process. And so because there are a number of early adopters like you uh, that are motivated for these behaviors, the extent to which you provide that visibility to help start to change the norms will make a big impact on these kinds of open science behaviors getting adopted more broadly. I wanna close with just a couple of examples of how it is that we can be uh, ineffective in our promotion of open science practices and how we might think about improving our effectiveness in our advocacy for these issues. One of the issues to wrestle with is open science as a social identity versus open science as good practice. A lot of the early advocates for open science, many of us that are here, are motivated by open science as an identity. We might identify with our research field, we might identify with the institution that we are a part of, say that's part of me. And many of us that are in the sort of the, uh, the vanguard of open science also identify with open science as an identity. I'm an open scientist. And that's great because it can provide a sense of community, of motivation, of sense of self. This is meaningful to me uh, to advance, try to advance these issues. But for the majority of researchers, open science is not and will not uh, be an identity per se. Their, their identities, re most researchers are identified primarily with the kind of work that they do, 
and the local things that are in their environments, right? My particular laboratory, my department, there are a variety of different identities or reasons or basis for how it is and why it is researchers do their work. So part of the messaging and engagement can't be you have to be an open scientist and make that part of your profile and put that in your Twitter bio and uh, in order to be part of the process because most researchers won't be motivated by that. Rather, the more effective messaging and engagement is to point out how it is that the open science behaviors themselves are good for their research practice. And because virtually every researcher wants to do a good job in their research, it'll be much more effective to engage them on how it is that these benefit practices rather than having a criterion of this really should be part of your identity. Uh, that's just going to be true of a, a small minority of people who are really at the uh, advocacy end of this. A second factor is appreciating that a lot of these open science practices take practice uh, to start doing them well. And it can be daunting to start to change our behavior and how we do our research toward new practices because it feels like, oh, what if I do it wrong? What if it goes badly? And a real effective change movement first gets people to start trying the behavior. Just give it a shot, get experience with it, right? Pre-registration is a perfect example. Pre-registration feels big uh, when we haven't done it before because it's a new kind of work planning and then documenting what we're doing before we've done the research, posting that to a service. And it can feel like that seems so big that it is daunting to even start to try. If we can instead adopt a model of getting people engaged with the behavior in order to get experience with the behavior, just like learning to ride a bicycle first requires getting on it and trying out things that aren't probably going to work but over time will turn into more effective use of that new technology. We will be more effective at engaging the community by adopting that model versus a model that is idealism. If you're gonna pre-register, make sure you do all of these things. And if you haven't done all of these things then you're a bad researcher because you didn't do all the things for that behavior. And of course we want to promote people doing these behaviors well, but we first need to do them at all and accept and embrace that it, the practice of it will improve the effectiveness over time. And it can be a real challenge for the, the vanguard, the people that are the early adopters that are really motivated by these practices. It can be easy to feel judgmental <laughs> of people who are starting these behaviors and aren't yet doing them as well as we are. Oh, we're so great at all of this and start to say, oh, here's what's wrong uh, with all of your practices. But that can be a real inhibition uh, when uh, it feels like a judgmental exercise to actually even enter the fray of some of these behaviors. And so to the extent that it can be welcoming, encouraging, and with a training mindset, we will be much more effective at bringing people along with these new behaviors. And that's highly related with the third point here, which is having open science as an all or none mindset versus an incremental mindset. A lot of people before they enter open science feel daunted by it because there are a variety of different behaviors, sharing preprints, sharing postprints, sharing data, open materials, pre-registration, open review. Oh, oh, I can't do all of these things. I, you know, I'm busy. I've got a, a lot of other things that I do. I'm not so sure about some of these uh, being relevant for my practice. And so I need to uh, if I want to be effective, be rec recognize that, that that's asking too much to say that you are going to flip from the way you do research today to an entirely open science practice. I've been an open science advocate for 12 years. I don't do all of the open science behaviors to the extent that I would like to do them. I've adopted them incrementally over the course of my career. How is it that I can be a little bit more open today than I was yesterday? And if we continue to adopt that mindset of incrementalism, that wherever you're ready to start, share a preprint, share a postprint, pre-register a study, any place to start is better today than it was yesterday in terms of advancing transparency and openness of the work that we do. And so if we can, in our change strategy and our advocacy, embrace and promote that, 
we will be much more effective at bringing along people who are interested, but not yet uh, to the stage of saying, I'm ready to do all of these things. There are others that might come up uh, in the question and answer, but I wanna close now so that we can uh, have as much time uh, to discuss a lot of these issues and the particulars uh, of the post-print pledge uh, as Ali presented. So thanks very much again for the invitation to be part of this and I'm delighted uh, to be part of the discussion. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you for very nice and informative talk. It was amazing. Well, uh, unfortunately, I do not have access to my Q&A box, but let me uh, uh, ask Mang to join us. Hello, Mang. Hi, hi, no worries. Um, I think uh, perhaps we can give the participants a couple of minutes uh, for them to type their questions. Um, and in the meantime, I see a quite, quite a number of panelists being present actually. So anybody who uh, has any comments or questions, please feel free to, uh, to sort of unmute yourself because as panelists, we can't really post to the Q&A box. Oh, actually we do have a question right now. So perhaps I, I can uh, read the questions. Um, okay. Yeah, so wonderful initiative. I'm very sympathetic to the post-print pledge, but I wonder whether this does not target the symptoms rather than the cause. Would it not be better to pledge to publish open access only, or at least as much as you can, preferably in diamond open access journals only, and stop launching new journals that are not diamond OA journals? So yeah, thank you for for this question. Now this is this idea is similar to the cost of knowledge model, where you you are you take the action to actively avoid certain outlet. This might work for established researchers who are confident that they can survive in academia by avoiding certain venues, but. If we think of junior researchers, they will be the ones at, high, at the higher risk of you know, being disadvantaged if we close some venues for them. So yes, I do agree that diamond open access is the best thing ever. If we can reach that point at some point in the future, that would be perfect. For the time being, why not if, if the law allows us to post the accepted versions of versions of our papers online, then why not? You know, let's raise awareness. Many people don't know this. They think that um, you know you sign the copyright and that's it. You have no choice. But in fact, you do legally. Just to build a little bit on what Al Ali was saying, uh, this really is part of this mindset of incrementalism. That yeah, that we can we can identify a whole different world order of how it is that scholarship is conducted and the business models supporting scholarship. But to get from here to there is a long way. Uh, and if we don't appreciate the competing interests that individual researchers have, right? I need to get a job, I need to keep a job, I feel too much pressure to get into these journals or those journals. We may say we shouldn't have those motivations, but we do at present. Uh, and they are, exist in varying degrees across the community. And so if, if, we are, if we rely on idealism purely, we will only bring along the idealists, many of which I suspect are here. Uh, and in, but so if we want to bring along everyone, we have to find solutions that build, we can build upon uh, that can bring along as many people as possible. Thanks for that great question. Yeah, we actually have another question uh, just coming through. So what if you're interested in signing the pledge, but are, are unsure if you can track down all the post-print versions of your published work? Yeah, this is an interesting question also. This is why we specifically mentioned future work. If you have the time to go back for your previous work and post the accepted versions also, that would be great. If you don't, at least from now on, once you receive the acceptance email from the journal, you go and publish the or post the uh, accepted version. 
I'll just add that the first time I posted a post print, I just decided I want to try this. So I went to a recent paper that I published and said, I'll just post this one. I found one, I'll post it. Once I did it, I was like, oh, wow, that was super easy to do it. Okay. Uh, and then I would go every day and post like three or four more of my old papers it, for the ones that I could find. And every time I did it, more people had access to my work than did before. Incrementalism. Yeah, very well said. Uh, we actually have a question uh, directed to Brian. So Brian, can you say a bit more about what the policy level on the theory of change model looks like? Are those policies at the level of learned societies, grant funding agencies, universities, or institutions? Thank you. Yeah, excellent question. Uh, so there are perhaps four key stakeholder groups that can set policies that change research practice. Right? There are federal, national, state uh, governments and agencies uh, that drive policy at whatever uh, level of control they have over uh, some part of the research community. Uh, there are funders. Uh, those could, can be federal funders, but also private uh, funders of research. There are journals and publishers of those journals that set policies for what it means to publish papers in, in their respective outlets. And there are institutions that hire staff and employees, researchers, uh, and what the responsibilities are for doing their work. You also might identify societies, but usually they only have policy impact in terms of the journals uh, that are associated with that society. Rarely does a society have policy impact uh, over other practices. They're very important for norms, uh, but not as much for policies. The key organizing principle that we uh, promote for uh, changing policies, I just put a link uh, to the page uh, in the chat, is called the top guidelines, transparency and openness promotion guidelines. And this is a policy framework for journals or funders or institutions to adopt, to set the expectations for what they mean about open practices uh, in their, their area of work, the grants that they fund, the, the papers they publish, the employees that work at their institution. And that has been broadly adopted. It's been endorsed by all of the major publishers, uh, and we've made the most progress uh, on the journal side of this. Um, and now we work on trying to promote stronger adoption by more journals. We have about 1,400 journals so far that have adopted at least some part uh, of that framework uh, for, their, uh, for the papers they publish. Uh, you can also look at uh, topfactor.org. It's linked from that. Oh, I didn't put it as a link there, but topfactor.org documents uh, what the policies are for different uh, journals. And so one of the things that we're doing is systematically going through different areas of research practice and coding the journals uh, on top factor for identifying which journals are promoting the strongest policies compared to others. Uh, so to the extent that you see any gaps there uh, in your fields, feel free to reach out to us uh, and we can collaborate on getting those journals coded so that there's more visibility uh, for the progressive uh, actors in the space. Uh, and we're doing now moving to the same for funders and then the horizon work will be on institutions to try to promote the same. So hopefully that gives a little bit of landscape, at least of how we think about uh, the policy part, but feel free to follow up on that. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we have another question. Uh, it's for Ali and Phil. I'm all in favor of the postprint pledge. Might this be something to try to integrate into IRIS instead of using a new platform or repository? Thank you, Luke, for this question. Excellent idea. If, if IRIS has this functionality to post the PDFs, uh, yeah, let's do it. You know, let's talk, let's talk about it later and see if it is possible. If yes, we will add the instructions to the Free Our Knowledge website where people can read it and follow it. Yeah, thank you. I think that's uh, currently all the questions we have. And um, yeah, there's a, just a comment. I think everyone can see the comments uh, in the chat as well. Um, so Emma has also said, uh, 
let's talk please post the announcement about new post prints to the yeah iris facebook yeah so already a lot of um, sort of action plans being formed yeah, I think we still have a, a sort of a couple of minutes and uh, I would really encourage people to sort of share thoughts, not necessarily questions. Um, but of course, if you have questions, please raise them. I wanted to just add something to piggyback off the ideas Brian was sharing. Um, there are quite a few journals in our field now that have signed on to the top factor uh, guidelines and some of them are performing quite, quite well, you know, quite highly ranked there. Um, and so obviously we realize that there are institutional or systemic ways that the field can incentivize open science. We're not naive to the fact that the postprint pledge is an individual solution to some of the lack of access issues that, that you know, are around. But at the same time, there has to be a kind of concerted effort. So although this is um, an individual response to kind of systemic issues, it, it will really help buy-in further down the line when there are institutional changes. If individuals are already enacting these practices, as Brian says, incrementally, so that there's this kind of confluence of factors at the individual level, systemic changes, institutional changes, which are really going to help um, really push it into the mainstream. Oh, we actually have another question. Uh, do you know if it's possible or appropriate to include a link to the postprint in the journal's abstract of the formatted publisher version? I've seen this with pre-registration, for example. It would be interesting to try this out. Uh, this is a very, very interesting idea. And I think here the poll is in the editor's court. I think in lobby the publishers and convince them to do this, that would be great. Yeah, definitely great. It's also possible on the services that Ali mentioned uh, to link back uh, to directly to the published version uh, from uh, the preprint or postprint version. So just to show you real quickly, I can uh, put on my screen, let's see. Uh, here is an example of the of paper on Sci Archive, uh, and you can see on the right side uh, the DOI of the preprint uh, that, that was posted here, um, that if you wanted to cite that directly for some reason, uh, and then you can add, once it's published in print, uh, the peer-reviewed publication DOI right there, uh, and then just clicking on it takes you to the uh, published version if that, for some reason, the person wants. So there's a lot of ways to link these together to both ensure people can discover the pieces that they are trying to discover uh, and uh, to get the, the credit uh, in terms of citation and everything else that one wants. I'll also note that Google Scholar at least is already pretty good at linking up citations that accumulated on preprints uh, with the ones that have accumulated on the published versions uh, and other services are getting better at this. Crossref, uh, one of the tools uh, that manages a lot of metadata behind the scenes, is doing more and more uh, to link up preprints uh, and published versions so that they uh, all of the citations and other information accumulate to both. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brian. I think we're up, about to uh, sort of reaching the end of the session. Uh, but of course, this is uh, this is sort of the con the conversation can still go on. So if anybody still has any questions or you know they think of uh, other ideas or suggestions, please feel free to reach out to the speakers. I'm I'm sure they're happy to sort of discuss further with you. I'll of course I'll hand back to to Maddie to wrap up the session. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brian. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Ali. It was very very productive and informative session. Uh, I really enjoyed it myself. Thank you so much. And everybody, thank you for uh, being in this session. We're going to have a very short break for like 15 minutes, and then we will come back uh, with another session, which is, I'm sure it, it is going to be super perfect session with Dr. Luke Plonsky. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, please take very good break and uh, see you again. <laughs>